Hello, everyone, and welcome. If you are a fan of cooking shows or have ever browsed the cookbook aisles at Barnes & Noble, then you're familiar with Tyler Florence. He has been a fixture on the Food Network since 2001 and has hosted shows including Food 911, How to Boil Water, Tyler's Ultimate, and The Great Food Truck Race. He's written six cookbooks, including Stirring the Pot, Dinner at My Place, Eat This Book, and Tyler Florence's Real Kitchen. His culinary training comes from Johnson & Wales University and working in many acclaimed New York kitchens. And now he lives in Northern California, where he's chef owner of several restaurants, including El Paseo and Wayfair Tavern in San Francisco. He also owns a cooking store, the Tyler Florence Shop in Mill Valley. I know Tyler's been on the road promoting his latest cookbook, Tyler Florence Family Meal, and on behalf of Boston Magazine, I'm thrilled we can host him here at the Boston Book Festival today. In a moment, I'll be turning over the stage to Tyler for a short presentation, and I'll be back for a brief Q&A session. Afterwards, we'd love to open up the conversation to the audience, so if you have any questions, please, I encourage you to raise your hand and ask Tyler any questions you have about his book, his many projects, or food and cooking in general. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Tyler Florence. Thank you, Tyler. Thank you. What's happening, guys? How are you? Good morning, Boston. Good to see you guys. A little chilly out. I got to say, I kind of like it, right? Is it nice this time of year when the weather starts to uh, drip a little bit and uh, a wool sweater sounds kind of inviting? It was kind of nice. Uh, so good to see you guys. Um, uh, my name is Tyler Florence. I'm a chef on the Food Network. It's my 15th year on the Food Network. Uh, uh, time flies by when you're having a good time, I guess. And uh, I have a show on the, on the Food Network called uh, Tyler's Ultimate. Uh, and it's my, uh, my fifth uh, series on the Food Network. I've been uh, with the Food Network since 1996. I was kind of one of the original five or six people on there. And uh, I started back when the Food Network wasn't even uh, 24 hours a day. It was just uh, about eight hours of programming. And uh, I had a show called uh, Food 911. Um, started back in 2000. And um, it was really kind of an interesting program at the time uh, because everything on the Food Network at that point was really a studio-based show with a chef and a chef's coat, chopping and scooping, that kind of thing. And I was the first chef on television not to wear a chef's coat, right, and actually take it from a studio standpoint out on the road. Not necessarily first chef on television, first chef on the Food Network. And uh, it, it was uh, kind of an interesting process because it wasn't necessarily about the food that I'd studied for, worked in restaurants to cook, to cook and produce on a regular basis. It was really more of a stripped down version of a show about great ingredients and everyday real people and real situations in their own house. And I've, you know, I've shot over 500 episodes. I've been to your house. <laughs> I've seen what's in your pantry. And, uh, you know, by and large, everybody really knew how to cook in a sense, but it was the nuances of flavor that they were missing. And after doing this for a while, you know, about five years, I really started to change how I approached food from a standpoint of you, know, you and me. Um, I have uh, three restaurants in San Francisco. We just opened up our first one uh, called Wayfair Tavern. Uh, it's in the old uh, former Rubicon space, uh, right underneath the Transamerica Tower in the Financial District. If you ever guys, you guys are ever out in the West Coast, we'd love to feed you. Um, but the interesting thing about that is because I have my colleagues, my chef colleagues around me, right? And we speak chef speak, right? It's like a cop. You know, you can only talk to another cop, you know? Uh, but to be able to uh, have the opportunity and pleasure of traveling around the country and working with everyday real people, it gives me a chance to see, you know, how, how do you cook dinner? How do you like to feed your family? And it's a very interesting perspective because a lot of chefs are very focused on the beautiful and the deep and the rare and the interesting. And a lot of people just need to get dinner on the table for the kids and get bath time before I pull my hair out before 9.30, right? So we started switching gears with our recipe writing and we started coming up with ideas about stripped down, simple, clean, delicious, easy, right? So you take a good piece of protein, one or two cooking steps, and you get a masterpiece out of that. And, and what I really focused the entire show, although it was really kind of underlying current, was just technique. So it was really about taking somebody and saying, okay, <clears throat> I love pot roast, but I don't know how to do it. I know my grandmother would take a piece of pork beef shoulder, put it into a crock pot, pour some water on top of it with a few sliced onions and call it a day. I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. What if we add a little bit of extra virgin olive oil? What if we sear it before we put it into a pot? What if we add garlic, rosemary, peppercorns, dry porcini mushroom? What about that, right? 
And then all of a sudden, it became really interesting because people started to shop differently. You know, with, and, and with the birth of the Food Network, um, grocery stores started to merchandise their stores differently in a sense that people were smarter. They came to the grocery store prepared. They knew what dry porcinis were all about, and they knew how to use them. So it's been very interesting. It's been a wonderful ride. Um, you know, the Food Network at this point, it's, um, the table is much bigger. There's a lot of people on there now. Uh, and uh, the, the diversity of the language is much differently. There's, you know, there's Iron Chef America, and there's Next Food Network star, and there's something for everybody. It doesn't really matter uh, where you are or how comfortable you feel in the kitchen. There's a show on the Food Network for you. And it's been really exciting because I've, it's given me a chance to connect with people on a way as a chef growing up in South Carolina, going to culinary school, and then going to New York City after that, that I would have never had the opportunity to do. I wouldn't be here right now if it wasn't for the Food Network, talking to you guys. I would be in a kitchen making mashed potatoes for the, you know, my 25th year. So, but, but it's really kind of exciting to kind of be back in it, you know. So this is my sixth cookbook. Uh, Family Meal is a, is a wonderful book about coming together uh, to a table and really celebrating what's important, and that's the human relationship. It's really important uh, to uh, develop that standard and that tradition with your children, please. It's very important. Um, something's happened probably a decade ago. Not two decades ago, because we're talking about our grandparents, but a decade ago, my parents. I'm, I'll be 40 in March, right? So my dad's 66, his generation. When it became uh, too difficult to make ends meet with one salary, when the mom left the house, and both parents had to go and work to make ends meet, something happened, tradition-wise, in the house where no one knew how to cook, right? How many people feel really comfortable? They know how to cook, right? They know how to cook, right? So it, it, it's, uh, it, it's something that there's no class or life lesson or school necessarily you can go to that teaches you how to feed yourself and feed your family. Not one. You got to wing it, right? And without that generation to generation to generation information sharing, like tribes in Africa do, how to hunt, right? How to grind corn, how to make a little mash out of acorns or whatever, right? No one really knows how to feed themselves and feed their family. And they fall victim to marketing and fast food and that kind of thing. It's not about the natural and the simple and that warm aroma of having a freshly cooked meal by your mother or your father on the weekend or on a Tuesday. It's more about the cardboard box being flipped open, you know, and do you want extra cheese and pepperoni, right? Not that there's anything wrong with that, right? Because I do, I do like extra cheese and pepperoni. As a choice, you know what I mean? But not as something that happens every day. And unfortunately, in America, as busy as we are, as disposable as the world is, uh, as, as little as thought that we put into it as we do, um, that's the way America has turned into. And if you travel around, I'm, I'm in a, uh, probably two transcom flights a week, you get a nice view of what America looks like, right? And it's, it's a thing where um, we are, without a doubt, what we eat. For me, writing a cookbook is a chance to communicate, right? It's a chance to say, you know, this is not how you should live your life, but a suggestion on some great recipes on how to feed your family and have your own life. Um, family meal is really about breaking bread and sharing time with the ones you love in a couple different places, because everything's important. Who you share a house with, those who you live with on a daily basis, your children, your, your in-laws, your grandparents, those in your neighborhood, which is very important. Those people that you drive by their house every day and you wave, right? There's a great chapter in my book called The, Pot, the Potluck, which is really kind of cool. How many people have ever had a, ever had a potluck dinner? You know, a potluck dinner where everybody kind of comes to the table and starts bringing stuff? That's a lot of fun, right? And also a really good idea for Thanksgiving, Yeah. <laughs> so all you got to do is make the turkey. And uh, then it's also about feeding your work family. Right, which is also very important. Um, I know in my work, what I do, especially with our restaurants, I spend 50, 60 hours a week with these people. I see my chef de cuisine more than I see my wife. Right? So we have a different relationship and a family in a sense too. So it's really about nurturing those people that are around you every day and don't let a minute go by without telling them that you appreciate them for who they are. And hopefully you do that through a plate of food. Right, so that's the idea of family meal. It's cool. 
So, uh, yeah, so, so, uh, so, so anyway, so we're, we're, uh, we're in Northern California, moved out there probably, uh, it'll be four years this February. I lived in New York City for about 14 years. And uh, moving out to California was sort of a, uh, an interesting shift in, in who I am because we just really want something simple. Uh, my wife and I, were, uh, we were pregnant and, you know, we were about to outgrow uh, my bachelor pad in New York City and uh, the thousand square foot two bedroom apartment that we had. And uh, we just wanted something new. She was uh, from Marin County, California, just across the Golden Gate Bridge. And uh, I always wanted to live in California. You know, I, I've got lots of friends in Los Angeles and I, I work there a lot. And uh, I was in San Francisco a handful of times a year for just business and hanging out and eating and drinking wine. And, and the idea of moving there sounded very interesting. So we really didn't have a lot of pre-thought of it. We literally, uh, on a sort of a vacation trip through Los, vacation slash house hunting trip through Los Angeles, because we were going to move there first. We, um, we uh, were staying at the, a hotel in Santa Monica, and we had a laptop open, and we had appointments all day, and we're looking at houses, and we didn't find anything that really worked for us, right? And then we started looking at houses in Northern California, and all of a sudden, these little cabins started to pop up, and these beautiful houses, and like on the beach, and you know, I was like, that's, that's where we want to live. That's the place to be a chef. That's the place we want to go next. So we, we wrapped up our stuff, we, uh, we hopped on the next flight, we went to, to uh, San Francisco, went to a folks' house, spent two weeks with her parents, and then on a rainy Sunday afternoon, we found this gorgeous little two-bedroom cabin. Um, we converted it to five bedrooms, but two-bedroom cabin in the Redwood Forest that was built in, uh, in 1926. It was a beautiful little place, right? And in my backyard, I've got um, 70 gigantic old-growth Redwood trees in my backyard. So coming from New York City to Mill Valley, I kind of replaced one skyline for the other. So all of a sudden, I've got these beautiful trees, and I've got, I got two creeks that run my backyard. I've got an apple tree. I've got two plum trees. I've got uh, wild uh, laurel, wild fennel, wild rosemary. I've got deer that walk in my backyard. I've got a family of wild turkeys live in my backyard. I'm trying to tell them it's not a good idea. <laughs> if there's any place you could be, it's probably not my backyard. Uh, but it, but it, it's, it, and we just, uh, we just uh, started raising bees. Uh, which is kind of exciting um, uh, because it, it's, uh, it's, it's tr starting to turn into this thing where it's sort of uh, a citizen approach of not only, you know, taking care of your own eco ecosystem, your own yard uh, through pollination, uh, but uh, the rewards are fantastic. We've got 3,000 Italian honeybees, so they're very posh. You sip espresso in the morning. <laughs> and and uh, I'm getting 40 pounds of honey this year. Uh, these little worker bees that do a thousand trips a day to go gather stuff and come back. It's amazing to watch. If you want something really kind of interesting, you can only start to raise a colony in April. So next spring, you might want to make a plan for it. But it's really kind of cool. I've got small kids. They're very docile. As long as you don't bother them, they don't bother you. Uh, and it's amazing to watch. It's pretty cool. So we, got, uh, we have bees. I just started uh, making wine. Uh, well, I started making wine on, on a big scale uh, this year. Uh, I just partnered up with Michael Mondavi of uh, you know, Nap Valley Royalty. Three minutes, thank you. And uh, so we, we just started producing uh, this year what I think is going to be what I'm kind of thinking about my end game, right? I'm going to be a winemaker, probably up in like Sonoma or Napa somewhere. And uh, we started making um, a really amazing Pinot Noir, a Cabernet Sauvignon, and um, a Zinfandel, which are just a big glass of velvet fog. It's delicious. And our partnership is kind of interesting because we're really kind of closing the food and wine gap in a sense, because winemakers make wine and chefs cook. Right? And they kind of come to the table at the last minute and say, well, I've got this, and that would kind of go with that. Well, what if you reverse the situation and a chef and a, and a winemaker actually start the blending process earlier? Right? How good can that possibly be? Two incredible palates really sculpting what wine can taste like. It's pretty good, i got to tell you. And um, so and we're opening up three restaurants. All right, so we wait for a tavern, and then uh, we're doing a, a steakhouse in downtown Mill Valley uh, with uh, Sammy Hagar. Uh, lead singer of Van Halen. Uh, it's an interesting place. I, I got to tell you, uh, Carlos Santana is my neighbor. Bonnie Raitt's my neighbor. Uh, interesting people live in the valley. And uh, so Sammy and I had uh, probably a dozen dinners at my house. And uh, he, uh, he, after the last one, he tapped me on the shoulder and says, we've got, we've got to do this for everybody else. We've got to have a restaurant. So we're doing a cool steakhouse in downtown Mill Valley. And then uh, I'm opening up a restaurant in uh, downtown Napa, uh, which is called Rotisserie and Wine. And it's going to be this sort of dreamy, Northern California picnic restaurant, which is going to be kind of cool. And uh, that'll be open in about 30 days, and then the steakhouse will be open probably first of the year. But it's exciting, I can tell you. I'm really, uh, every day I get to wake up and be me for a living, and uh, I don't take it for granted for a second. Uh, I work 80 hours a week, and I'm psyched. I love it. 
I love what I do. Um, so first, congratulations on your sixth cookbook. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, about this one in particular, um, I noticed that the way it's split up, the way it's, you've got a whole first section on how you cook at home with mm -hmm. your family, your immediate family, and then you move on to, you open it up to your extended family, your neighbors and your friends, and then the last section is really focused on restaurants. It's really like three cookbooks in one. Was there any temptation to make three different cookbooks, or why bring them together? Well, you know what? Um, um, once you've written uh, three or four books, um, you really have to go deep as far as what you're, what you're going to talk about as far as the subject matter. And we stopped trying to make it up you know, with a theme a while ago because, I, frank, frankly, I, I, I felt what we were doing today was much more interesting than kind of coming up with 20-minute you know, meal, five-minute fix kind of thing. I just think that's sort of kind of a contrived way to write books. Mm -hmm. And it's very a limited focus as far as what they are. And, I, and it's just a very human process. We kind of take a look at around, uh, around us, what's going on immediately. And uh, we start to figure out if there's some subject matter there. Mm -hmm. And we start to write about basically what we're doing right now. Yeah. And uh, that's, uh, you know, raising uh, three beautiful children. Mm -hmm. I've got a 14-year-old who just started high school this year. Uh, ladies, lock up your daughters. There's another Florence kid in the list. <laughs> Does and, he cook? And uh, there's, and I, have, I have a beautiful three-year-old boy. Uh, he was he's so so smart. I'm not kidding. Hayden is, to me, if you think about it, um, it's like that sort of 10,000-hour rule. Uh, he's three, right? So uh, at this point, he's probably if he could if he could dress himself and drive a car, he could probably go to work and be fine. <laughs> Because if you think about it, after three years of kind of figuring out the world, not much changes. You know yeah. what I mean? A bus is a bus, a truck's a truck, a house is a house. You know, you know, Barney's Barney, that kind of thing. And, and uh, he's very, very interesting. And, and uh, our, our, our youngest child, Dorothy, uh, who's, who's two, she's had her first class picture in pre-K yesterday. And uh, she, she's got like, uh, she's got like a little bow in her hair. Hair's coming slow. It's thick, but it's, it's you know, it's like it's a little slow. Uh, but, uh, but she's so beautiful, and, and, and she, she's, uh, she's getting a little mouthy. Uh, somebody <laughs> told her how to say no when she's using it, and, uh, but, but she, she's fantastic. And, and for, for us, it was just a matter of saying, okay, this is, this is real life. Mm -hmm. you know, this is our family, and we feed each other. Yeah. Um, the, the title Family Meal is sort of a double entendre with, with, um, with what's known in the restaurant industry as Family Meal, and that's the meal that you serve, the wait staff and the cooks, and the management before service starts. Mm -hmm. And it gives you a chance to kind of sit down and air any, any dirty laundry, talk about, you know, last night's Yelp review, uh, talk about, you know, basically the specials of the day, you know, talk about with a lineup yeah. with the sommelier, talk about the wines. And, uh, and the reverse idea of that is a meal fed to your family. Mm -hmm. And that's uh, from a chef's point of view of just clocking out and uh, cooking at home. Yeah. yeah. Well, I noticed your kids are definitely an influence, especially in those first chapters. And you've got recipes as simple as, you know, Hayden's chocolate chip pancakes or mm -hmm. those chicken fingers. When you're writing a cookbook like this, and the recipes do range from the simple like that to bone marrow with rutabaga jam, you know, what kind of uh, expertise or cook, you know, cook, cooking experience do you uh, have to assume that your readers have. Well, um, for, for, for the most part, I, I think I think there's a, there's a, there's a range of things. Like the realistically, right? When when you when you pick up a cookbook and when you buy a cookbook, because I've got 600 cookbooks and I have a retail store in Northern California and I get all the new ones and usually get them pretty far in advance. And if 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 I'm really inspired by a book, I'll probably cook a handful of recipes, five, seven. You know, really kind of get the gist of the writer and kind of get their, their cooking style. Um, and, but I, what I really love, honestly, is their point of view and their 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 kind of understanding where their mind's at. Um, do I expect them to make uh, bone marrow with rutabaga jam? Mm -hmm. Maybe, right? Would do I want to turn you on to that dish at Wayfair Tavern when you come in? Absolutely, you know. So that that's kind of where that is. It's just it's just really kind of understanding uh, a, a range of things. So it's not just about. Because um, you know, Food Network, uh, as wonderful they are, they, uh, they do have a tendency to, to be very, very, you know, very cooking at home kind of focused. Mm -hmm. And that's just really half of who I am. Um, the other half of that is an artist and, and, and a, a restaurateur and, and uh, a hospitality aficionado and somebody who just really loves, you know, opening their doors every day and, and, and having you in my restaurant and having a good time with it. Mm -hmm. And the whimsy that kind of comes around with that, that level of creativity, and that, that, that's what I like a lot. So it's really not about kind of putting it in a box and calling it something. It's yeah. more just sort of looking around every day and say, what do we got here? Yeah, and then, I mean, there's an incredible amount of enthusiasm you have for ingredients. Um, you're blessed to live in Northern California where you have access to heirloom ingredients all year round. We're in New England, <laughs> so. Um, <laughs> it's October, yes. Yeah, yeah it yeah, is. Yeah, yeah. Um, so so yeah. our supplies are dwindling. Um, 
you know, what, what can somebody who doesn't have access to, say, Kirby cucumbers or donut peaches do with a recipe in your book that, you know, really highlights those ingredients? So this is about someone early as far as technique. Right? So Food 911 was a show that was just really about, if you watch the show, and, and, and actually they're running reruns because some of those episodes are a decade old, uh, which is funny to watch yourself age like that in 10 years. Uh, but but a, lot, a lot of those um, episodes are, are kind of timeless in a sense because gnocchi is still gnocchi, you know, and pasta is still pasta, and pizza dough is still pizza dough, and, and a braise is still a braise. And if, if you watch those, it's really kind of technique driven. And if you've got the ability to, to master a few techniques, and I'm not saying get crazy with it, but if you know how to, if you know how to braise, right? Braising, that's what the winter is all about, in my opinion. So you could take the idea of, you know, doing lamb shanks to beef shoulder, right? Very easily. Or pork shoulder, which is really nice too. Um, um, if, if you've got the ability to take a look at something and kind of analyze something in the grocery store and say, okay, what do I know how to do? Um, I know how to roast. I know how to braise. I know how to, I know how to use a crock pot, which is fantastic. I know how to use a pressure cooker, which is fantastic. I just did a, a demo two weeks ago in California where we did lamb shanks. I did them in a pressure cooker and they were done in 20 minutes. Wow. Yeah. It was awesome. So it's really about, if you've got the idea of, of, of a clear focus of technique, once you get to the store, you can really kind of let the grocery store tell you what's for dinner and not hopefully be afraid of it. Yeah, so, so, it does, yeah, so to me, like summer, like, you know, lo like lobster and, and corn and basil and tomatoes and, you know, burrata and all these, you know, really good grassy green olive oils, to me that's summertime, mm -hmm. but now we're kind of in this different sensibility where it's more about, you know, braised roots and, and delicious unctuous braises mm -hmm. and, and creamy thick purees and, and Zinfandel and Cabernet Sauvignon and like these really kind of rich nuances, rosemary, smoked sea salt. Right. That to me, it's just like, I'm, I embrace it. Yeah. And I mean, more than any other cookbook I, that you've done, I feel like this one is an opportunity to read about cooking and just sit down with it and read it. I know you have these interludes about, you know, your shops and about your experiences in restaurant kitchens. There's also a pheasant hunt yeah. in there. How yeah. often do you actually go out and, and hunt pheasant? Uh, I, 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 do, I do it quite a bit. It's kind of interesting because I've, I've, um, I, I grew up as, you know, really a hunter, but I mean, sort of, you know, with, with a, um, as, a <laughs> as a kid who was wildly unsupervised with a 22. Um, 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 in like upstate South Carolina where there's nothing going on and I'm telling you like a couple of rounds in a 22 in the middle of the woods for a couple of teenagers that is about as good as it gets you know um, so to me like the idea of, of uh, hunting and gathering is really kind of interesting in a sense like you, you know it's one thing to, to go to a grocery store and kind of see that you know but it's another thing to go kill it cook it and eat it you know and it's really kind of an interesting perspective if you think about it it's very primal mm -hmm. um, so there's, uh, there's a, I've got a few friends in northern California that we, we, uh, we actually like to go hunting and it's kind of cool because it's just on the, on the border of Marin County and Sonoma County so you're literally hunting in the grapevines which is kind of cool like shooting pheasant like in those Cabernet Sauvignon grapes in front of you. It's kind of cool. Yeah. So, uh, so we like to do that a couple times a year and, um, um, it depends on how busy I am, but, uh, it, it's, uh, it, it, it's a, it's a blast. Well, I mean, you, you mentioned the disconnect between kind of what we see in our supermarkets and, and you know, what, what's out there and what's in, in your cookbook. Do you definitely, do you feel like you have pressure from either publishers or the networks to gear more towards those mass market, the things we could find at our stop and shop versus the artis artisan ingredients? You know? Well, uh, if, if for the most part, if, if, if you take a look at this, there's nothing really art, super artisanal about it. I mean, there, there's some interesting ingredients, and, uh, but, but for the most part, like, like, the, like the, the gift of, of working with Food Network, as long as I have, I get it. Like, I'm not going to put anything in a book that you can't necessarily find at a grocery store uh, because I don't think it would be fair because I want you to cook out of the book. We do a lot of uh, painstaking work to make sure all the recipes are tested down to the grain of salt. So if you go to the grocery store and you buy the ingredients, I promise you it's going to work out. Right? So that, that to me, like, as a, as a cookbook writer uh, and also somebody who, you know, at our retail store, we get a lot of books. And I've, I've made recipes that didn't work out and they were flawed. And I'm like, who's paying attention here? Mm -hmm. Like, is, is somebody just kind of writing these things down off the top of their head or they actually go through a testing process? Yeah. So, uh, so, so for us, like with, with um, a lot of the recipes here, even if it, they, they feel simple, and some are just sort of, you know, uh, great uh, Bosque pears that are slightly sauteed, a little bit of brown sugar and butter, a little bit of lemon juice, and uh, the, the topping is simply uh, mascarpone cheese uh, with raisins soaked in rum and sugar on top, yeah. and a little crumbled uh, uh, amaretto cookie on top of that. That sounds good. You know, that's four ingredients. You know, it takes you about 20 minutes. It's, it's killer. And, uh, and I, I love that style of cooking because it's just about, about um, take, you know, because anybody can put more things on the plate. Mm -hmm. But I think it takes somebody who really understands nuances to put less on the plate and make it exciting. So it's about balance and about technique. Mm -hmm. 
Everything's got to have a crunch. Everything's got to have an unctuousness to it. There's a you know spicy, sour, salty, sweet balance. You know everything has to be delicious and it has a roll on your palate when you taste it. You have to salivate when you eat it. You Are know? there any um, recipes that you tested and have been major disasters over the years? Things you couldn't get to work. Well, there, there's there's a um, um, yes, and there's also concepts that I thought were great and nobody nobody really. <laughs> Nobody's really into it but me. Um, and you know, and, and I, I think that's really kind of a flaw of a lot of chefs so because, uh, and, and not that there's anything wrong with it, um, but the esoteric uh, temple of gastronomy uh, that was so big in the last decade, um, uh, to me, I, I don't know if it's, it's a food style that it's always going to have a place. We're always going to enjoy things at the highest level. But for the most part, if you go to a restaurant and you have this like, you know, $500 four star experience that, it's you and somebody else or a table for, and you walk out of that, ask yourself a question if you can really remember what you had for dinner the next day. Mm -hmm. Try to remember that special, not the, not the, not the evening, because the evening's great, the friends are great, the company's great. Try to remember what you had for dinner. It's impossible, mm -hmm. just because it's so esoteric and so out there. Right. So to me, like, I like to really kind of focus on things that are just bang, right? Really strip down more about uh, the nuances of the protein and making that taste fantastic and something that's really going to make an impression on you. So you're not likely to ever see a meat glue or a, or a foam or... You know, I, 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 I think it's cute. Um, you know, it, it's, uh, it's, it's definitely something that it's like once you've had it, you've had it once, you've had it, uh, uh, you know, a million times. But to me, like, what I, I get sort of frustrated with going to dinner, and I travel a lot, um, is really seeing this sort of homogenization of what I call generic nice food. And, and it, you can have the same meal in Boston and Los Angeles and London and Toronto and Sydney. And like, you can, it, you, if you, you can have, it's like there's one cookbook mm -hmm. that everybody pulls from. Yeah. And to me, what I'm really kind of missing is the locale. You know, we went to Union Oyster House last night, and I loved it. You know what I mean? Great that's, chowder. That's great chowder <laughs> and great lobster, and it was fantastic. To me, I'll remember that yeah. for a long time to come because it was really about what makes Boston special and Boston fantastic. That's what I love about that. Like, to me, like, like San Francisco, our restaurant, Wayfair Tavern, is really a restaurant that's about San Francisco. Mm -hmm. um, we did a lot of research on, uh, on local... Uh, not necessarily ingredients, but local points of view um, with great old dishes um, that are, you know, fantastic. Like, uh, like a few of our oyster dishes are really fantastic and very special in San Francisco. And, uh, and, you know, the Green Goddess dressing, as a matter of fact, which is really delicious, which is on our menu, uh, was invented at the, at the uh, Palace Hotel uh, in, uh, before the earthquake in, like, 1904, I think. And so there's a lot of things about food in San Francisco, Dungeons Crab specifically, that are about ingredient focus that's just mm -hmm. so fantastic. Yeah. You know? So to me, when, when, if you come to San Francisco, I don't want you to just have a nice meal. I want you to have a nice time in San Francisco mm -hmm. and taste with the nuances of the city. So it's like taking the, the classic recipe, updating it, upgrading it, making it better, just like classic cocktails are coming back and people right. are doing them better than ever. You can take, you know, San Francisco dishes, or we can take Boston dishes. And exactly, make exactly. Them better than and, ever. and to me, like, I, I think that's what's really special about not, not not trying to outdo the other guy on the other side of the world, but really kind of celebrate what where you are and make that very special and important to me. I like that. Yeah. Um, but uh, for the most part, it's really about you know kind of setting up a balance. I don't know if I necessarily want to have a restaurant in Vegas. Um, I want to be able to have restaurants that I can drive to uh, for the most part. So I live in Mill Valley, which is in between San Francisco and Napa. So to me, like, if, if, if it all comes together the way I, I think it's going to, because we've got a nice team of got 18 employees, personal employees, and uh, they're all into making sure that the next step is as fluid as possible and, and I'm not too thin where I can't really make a difference. Uh, but uh, we've got some really great people. I just hired uh, Jeremy Fox, who was the, uh, the uh, executive chef of Ubuntu up in Napa. He received a Michelin star. Uh, he just came aboard as our creative director. So he's my, uh, my thicker layer of thin. And, uh, and for me, I, I want to be able to, to at least be in two restaurants a day, you know, go expedite lunch in San Francisco and wrap up dinner in Napa and that kind of thing. So it's, uh, it, it's, it's a balance. It's a juggle. It, 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 I never want to be, you know, so big that the brand is just completely diluted. And I'm sure you guys have been to Las Vegas and, and been to a restaurant that was marqueed by somebody big and you walked out and go, I don't get it, right? That was one of the most boring meals I've ever had my entire life. And I've had tons of them. Because, like, uh, I, I had a conversation with John George one time, uh, right before he got his four-star review um, uh, from Ruth Reichel um, at, at his, his namesake restaurant uh, at uh, John George. And it was funny, just, you know, a chef on his level, a chef on my level, well, just kind of talk about the same thing, and that's um, consistency. You know, it's a, he said, like, I will write a menu or a recipe that's perfect, absolutely perfect, and I'll hand it to a guy who I love and been working with for 20 years, and it loses 20%. It just does. 
So what my goal right now is just to make sure the margin of error is real thin, right? My guys are super well trained, or they're out. Uh, that, that the food is of, of a certain level and certain quality, or, or the chef de cuisine's gone. Um, so it, it's just about like kind of being tough, but, but, also, but to me, like, it's my reputation at stake, not this line cook guy. So it, it's really about making sure when you guys come to our restaurant, it's that experience that you were looking for, that you walk out and go, I get it. So I, I have an organic baby food company called Sprout. Um, it's, uh, we started about, started about six years ago. We actually got to market about two years ago. It's the fourth largest baby food in the United States, um, and it's delicious. It's, uh, it's, it's literally recipes. I've made all of them in my, in my, in my own kitchen. I've, uh, my kids were my guinea pigs. <laughs> <laughs> so if they didn't like it, we, 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 didn't, we, didn't, we didn't push forward with the recipe. Uh, but it was real, it's really about um, opening up uh, a wide range of options to children at a very, very young age, which is really important. It's really important that kids from a very, very small age, you ever you know, heard that sort of that, the idea that children uh, learn much faster at a higher rate when they're small? Like you could, they, they have the ability to learn a couple of different languages where at adults, you just kind of, that process sort of starts to shut itself off. Um, so Dr. Alan Green, who's a, a, a world-class pediatrician out of, uh, out of Stanford, uh, really nice guy. He's a, sort of a fan of Sprout, and, and we are of, his, uh, of him and his company and what he does. He writes some amazing books. He, we had dinner one night, and I had already assumed this, but he kind of brought up the light. I thought it was so interesting. He said that children, um, at, if they're not introduced to a flavor or a food product, by the time they're three years old, it's a fight or flight response that's embedded in our DNA um, that they will not eat it, not want to try it, and assume that it will hurt them by the age of three. And if you can imagine yourself in a more primal situation, right, uh, you know, apes in the Serengeti or whatever, right, uh, or the Congo, if, if your mother has not shown you what to eat, right, you're not going to go grab a berry off a bush, right? And it's the same situation with children, that if, if you're not introducing them to, to foods at a young age, a wide range of foods, and I'm not talking about, you know, pizza, burger, chicken nuggets, that kind of thing. I'm talking about food, vegetables, fresh vegetables, shop at the perimeter of the grocery store, right? You're not doing them a favor by giving them the ability to say, I like it, I don't like it. The children, by the time they're six, right, by the time they get to, to grade school, did you guys see Jamie Oliver's show? Right? When he was with the first graders and they said, hey, you know, what is this, a potato or an onion? And they didn't know the difference. By the time they're six in the first grade, they're gone. They've already established what their boundaries are of food and what they like and they don't like. And if, and if you want them to eat it, be prepared for a fight, right? Because they're going to give you one, right? It's their job to push their boundaries and establish their own place in the world. And it's your job to, you know, stand up for their nutritional well-being. And it's got to start early. If you start late, good luck. So it's really about kind of opening up the menu for children at a very young age, a very young age. Like my children, all they eat are vegetables. I'll get back to your question. How do you cook vegetables that kids will eat? This is a trick my wife and I have, and it works, right? It works with Brussels sprouts, cauliflower, zucchini, green beans, carrots, uh, butternut squash, you name it. We roast them in, in, in the oven, right? So we'll take zucchini, cut it up in like consistent pieces, put it onto a sheet pan, a little bit of extra virgin olive oil, salt and pepper in the oven, 350, 20, 25 minutes, right? What happens inside everything, there's a natural level of sugar that, um, that uh, once um, introduced to heat, turns into a natural carbohydrate uh, and starts to taste good because your palate identifies sweet and identifies that and likes it a lot, right? And that's the reason kids will gravitate towards anything that has a sugar content to it. So you can take these vegetables, right, and give them a sugar content by actually roasting them, and they're fantastic. And there's not a vegetable, I'm not lying to you, not a vegetable my kids won't eat because we roast them. Yeah. Something to think about. You know, there, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of people that, that have influenced me over, over, over my life, and, and it's really about, like, just little clips of things that have been really inspiring to me. Like, last night, I'm not kidding, like, Union Oyster House was very important as an experience to me because it was the real deal, right? The authentic. And that's always what, what I go for. So if I have I'll, I'll dinner at a restaurant or, you know, or, or cause we, we do, you know, cookbook events very similar to this in my shop in Mill Valley. And, and, and if, if they don't really have an honest point of view, my, they're just boring. You know I mean? They're, they're, I'm not saying they're not passionate about what they do, but their level of interest and my level of interest is not the same thing, right? So it's gotta be from a very authentic point of view. Um, but for me, like I, I, I enjoy people who have a vision 
not just necessarily for a plate of food, but for a lifestyle. Like I, I think, I think uh, Ralph Lauren's restaurant in Paris is probably one of the most important restaurants in the world, right? Because he actually took a burger and did it at a really, really high level in this phenomenal restaurant that is all about the American idea, and, and, and Paris is eating it up like crazy, right? To me, I think that's an important point of view. So is Ralph Lauren one of the chefs I look up for? I don't know, maybe. But he's doing an idea that people gravitate towards. And it's not just about trying to tell a joke that I think is funny. It's about opening up uh, a restaurant or, or writing a book or doing a television show that, that a lot of people find kind of compelling. And it's about taking the idea and really streamlining it down and taking simple things and doing them very, very well, very well. And, uh, and, and kind of leaving it at that. Um, so uh, I, I grew up in upstate South Carolina. I started washing dishes at the age of 15. Um, I, uh, my parents were backbone people. Uh, no, no one ever gave, gave me a thing. I, I paid for everything I've ever done in my life. I paid for my own college. Uh, and my parents, because they didn't have it. My parents weren't, 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 weren't even barely, barely middle class. And uh, it, it, it's, uh, it's a thing where um, um, if, if, if you really know who you are, especially at a young age, and parents who have like teenage kids, it's, it might be time to start paying attention to them as far as what, what they're really kind of into. Because their passion, I'm not saying things kind of fade in and out because I have a 14 year old and, and he's kind of in this mumbly stage right now. <laughs> I don't know what he's talking about. How was your day? <laughs> um, what'd you do to school today? <laughs> <laughs> what do you want for dinner? <laughs> <laughs> so it, it's, uh, but, it, but, but if you'll, you'll notice what they gravitate towards, right? And, to, and it, you might want to start developing that with them. Right. Be prepared to pull the plug if they're not interested any longer because it could happen. But but there could be a little nugget in that that could be who they are as a person. I started washing dishes in a restaurant when I was 15, and I um, I really fell in love with the craft of cooking, and I, I never looked back. I never looked back. Um, so by the time I went to Johnson Wales University in Charleston, South Carolina, in state tuition, um, um, I had already had four plus years in a restaurant, which is a lot more experience than anybody else in my class had. And uh, uh, I, I, bree I breezed through culinary school. Um, I, I got a culinary degree, and then I stuck around and got a business degree, which is very important if anybody is thinking about becoming a chef. Anybody can make a nice scallop, right? But a really talented chef will bankrupt the restaurant in 60 days if you don't know what you're doing, right? It's a lot of money. So it's very important to have kind of the business understanding what that's all about. So I stuck around for uh, uh, another degree. And then in 2005, Johnson Wells University gave me an honorary doctorate. It's Dr. Tyler. It's kind of cool. <laughs> got, a nice, got a nice ring to it. So, so I, 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 so I was in. I, I decided once I graduated from from uh, from college that you know when you take yourself seriously, uh, you either go to Paris or you go to New York. And I didn't really speak French, so New York was it. And uh, I started working with Charlie Palmer, Charlie Palmer at Oriel, uh, in New York City uh, back in the early '90s when he was just the most gigantic name in the world, uh, especially in America. And I worked for him for about a year and a half, uh, two different restaurants of his. And then I, um, I uh, started kind of bouncing around uh, New York uh, for a while. I worked at uh, a mafia joint down in Tribeca, which is very interesting because the FBI stormed the place one day. <laughs> very weird. I'll tell you about that later because there's no such thing as mafia. Um, <laughs> And, uh, uh, and then I, I worked at a hipster place uh, in the village, um, um, in the East Village. I, um, you know, I was uh, the executive chef of a place you know, in, on 41st Street and 2nd Avenue on the cusp of Tudor City called Chibo. Uh, and that's where you know, I, I was my first position with the Food Network. I was a chef there. Um, so I really kind of bounced around. I worked with a, woman, a beautiful woman named Marta Pulini, who was, uh, uh, she was a, a corporate chef for Pino Luongo and his, his Coco Pazza group uh, at a restaurant called Mat 61 in the basement of Barney's. And uh, she taught me the nuances of great Tuscan food before I went to Tuscany. And so it's just really sort of, you know, just, I never really had a solid track until I got on television. And then life got really different and very interesting very quickly. And it was more about trying to figure, because everybody was like, you gotta be a brand. And you go, what's your brand? And what's your position? Uh, I'm like, I don't know, I just like to cook, I don't know. I don't really have a catchphrase. I don't really have a shtick. I don't have one. Like me or don't. I mean, I, I don't know. I just like, I like to cook and that's it, you know? So it, it, it's, uh, it was more about kind of creating like a very authentic real point of view that I've always seemed to, uh, for me, the most important part of my integrity, I feel, is just I don't I don't do kitschy stuff. I just do what feels good, and either you're into it or you're not. And uh, for me, like I, I really I like you know, everything I do comes from my heart. Everything I do uh, comes from a very like real place, and the food's good. You know, that's it.
we're going to have to wrap it up here today, but uh, I would like to thank you all for coming this after this morning to uh, the Boston Book Festival. I hope you uh, have a full day of wonderful literary events ahead of you. And again, thank you to Tyler Florence. If we can give him a round of applause. Thank you.